high profile pastors like Stephen Lawson, who was the dean of John MacArthur's seminary, and Robert Morris, the pastor of Gateway Church, have recently stepped down due to moral failures involving inappropriate relationships. These resignations have rocked their congregations and raised serious questions about how pastors, particularly pastors who place a considerable focus on holiness, good works, and sanctification can end up getting caught in these situations. Many of these leaders have emphasized personal holiness and good works as proof of salvation. This is a failure to understand salvation, which is by grace through faith. They have instead succeeded in mixing a deadly cocktail of grace, law, and good works. How do we understand good works? How do good works work? Good works have been dramatically misunderstood in Christianity, and as a result, it's created a problem that's persisted for centuries. Now, I don't in any way wish to condemn any of these pastors at all, but there is a lesson for us to be learnt for those who are willing to listen. It's recently been reported that five pastors, not just the two mentioned, have been forced to step down from their positions due to moral failures, particularly inappropriate relationships. Among them are obviously, as mentioned, Stephen Lawson, Dean of John MacArthur's Seminary and pastor at Trinitary Bible Church in Dallas. He was removed from ministry after admitting to an inappropriate relationship. His removal has caused significant disruption in his ministries and his affiliations. Robert Morris, He's the pastor of Gateway Church in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, stepped down from following serious allegations of misconduct. His departure is part of a wider wave of pastoral resignations in that particular region, causing concerns about church leadership accountability. It's very clear that pastors like Stephen Lawson and Robert Morris have been strong proponents of a high standard of personal holiness, focusing on good works and moral purity in their teaching. Stephen Lawson, for instance, has a long history of emphasizing the gravity of sin and the need for continuous self-examination in the life of a believer, drawing from passages like Romans 7 and Galatians 5. Lawson emphasizes repentance, sanctification, the need for ongoing transformation, and he sees these as evidence of salvation. He frequently spoke against sin and the need for true Christians to grow in holiness, teaching that believers are being saved from the power of sin through sanctification and ultimately from the presence of sin through glorification. These pastors, whether knowingly or unknowingly, basically encourage their believers, their congregations to stop sinning or to exhibit behavior consistent with true transformation. Now, this is a common reformed or Calvinist teaching where sanctification is seen as a fruit of true salvation. Teachings like this, when not understood correctly and according to the gospel of the grace of God, will create a fruit inspector mentality. The concept of fruit inspecting is where believers judge others' salvation based on their outward works or their behaviors. Are they attending church? Are they water baptized? Are they going to Bible study? Do they appear holy by the way they dress or by the way they look? This is rooted in a misapplication of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 16. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. So in context, Jesus is speaking about false prophets, specifically speaking about false prophets, not about the average believer inspecting the fruits of another believer. He's warning that false prophets can be identified by their fruit. Do they lead people to God, to the truth of Christ, or do they lead them away from God? What message are they preaching? Are they glorifying God and leading people to the truth of Christ, 
or are they following their own wicked hearts and the doctrines of men? The ravenous wolves that Jesus refers to in Matthew 7 appear to many of us like innocent sheep, just like the devil himself can appear like an angel of light. They sound right. They may even use the name of Jesus, but inside they are ravenous wolves. This passage is frequently misapplied by many to justify the judging of fellow believers based on their external behaviours, assuming that good works are the definitive proof of their salvation. Other verses that are used to encourage fruit inspection include James 2.17. Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. This is sometimes cited to argue that good works are necessary to prove one's faith. James is speaking specifically to Israel here, who, being Israel and whom were given the law, were obligated to perform certain works in order to prove their faith. These works were things such as circumcision, baptism, sacrifices, law-keeping, and so on. They may also use scriptures such as Galatians 5 and verses 22 to 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, so long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. This verse clearly describes the fruit produced by the Holy Spirit in a believer's life. Some will use this verse to argue that a true believer should display these qualities consistently, leading to fruit inspection if they don't. The idea of judging someone's salvation by their fruits often turns into legalism and a focus on outward works, which goes against the biblical teaching of salvation by grace through faith, which we know in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 to 9. It's important to remember that while good works and spiritual fruits are outcomes of a believer's relationship with Christ, they are not the basis for salvation, nor should they be used as a tool to scrutinize other, than other people's faith. When leaders who hold these erroneous views on holiness and works and overemphasize them get caught being naughty, it highlights a discrepancy between their preaching and their personal actions, which can be embarrassing for them and confusing and disheartening for their congregations. These pastors' emphasis on moral standards, when not upheld in their personal lives, also provides fuel for criticism. We've seen Jimmy Swaggart back in the 1980s, preaching to the world and representing a form of Christianity. Swaggart preached good works. Jimmy Swaggart preached holiness. Then he got caught in a sexual misconduct incident. After his public fall in the late 1980s, Jimmy Swaggart admitted that his misunderstanding of sanctification played a role in his downfall. Swaggart claimed that despite being a believer, he didn't understand the process of being sanctified by grace through faith, which led to his struggles. This in itself is quite true. He most certainly did misunderstand sanctification. However, nothing's changed. Today, Swaggart teaches that sanctification comes through faith in the cross, emphasizing what he refers to as the message of the cross, which sounds good on the surface. Paul uses that terminology. He does call the gospel of our salvation the message of the cross. However, Jimmy Swaggart's recent teachings and his Bible commentary give the clear impression that if one truly understands sanctification through his message of the cross, they can't fall into sin after being saved. This is incredibly dangerous. Even after conversion, believers are never immune to sin. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8 says, says if we say, that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Paul addresses the reality of ongoing sin in the life of believers after salvation in several key passages, emphasizing that while believers are justified by faith in Christ, they still struggle with sin because of the flesh. If we understood this, and if we taught this correctly, it would alleviate a lot of the pressure off people 
that are feeling like they need to pretend to be holy when they know that they are not. Here are some key verses where Paul acknowledges this tension. Romans chapter 7 verses 15 through to 25. This, is, this passage is one of the clearest in showing Paul's own struggle with sin. Paul was well and truly converted at this point, baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now that it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity of the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. This is clear as crystal. How many preachers do you hear speaking on this particular passage? How many preachers avoid this? How many preachers try to twist this? It is very clear what happens after we trust Christ for our salvation. And becoming sinless in this body is not something that ever happens to anyone, ever. Paul here is describing the inner conflict between the renewed spirit, which is the desire to do good, and this sinful flesh, the inability to perfectly carry it out. Even as a believer, Paul acknowledges that he continues to struggle with sin. Romans 6 verses 12 to 13, Paul warns believers not to let sin reign in their bodies, which indicates the ongoing temptation and the ongoing presence of sin. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. This exhortation would be totally unnecessary if believers no longer sinned after salvation. Galatians 5 verse 16 to 17. In this particular passage, Paul describes the constant battle between the flesh and the spirit. Then I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. Here Paul emphasizes that believer's life is characterized by a battle between the sinful nature of the flesh and the spirit, which has been made new. Though believers are empowered by the spirit, they still have to resist the desires of the flesh. This does not always go the way that we would like. And this is a reality. These preachers have not highlighted this. These preachers have not taught this. They have taught the complete opposite and now they have been caught in compromising situations. It does not mean we should just go out and sin like mad and use grace as a license to sin. It's quite the opposite. But we still sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. Paul rebukes the Corinthians for their immaturity and their ongoing sinful behaviors despite being believers. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. For you are not carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? So Paul's obviously addressing Christians, he's addressing believers, yet he points out their carnal behavior, showing that even believers can live in a way that is not fully in line with the Spirit. I can tell you, I struggle with sin. I sin. I hate my sin, but Christ gives me peace. 
he gives me certainty that his payment was sufficient. People need to hear this because it is truth. People do not need to see pastors up on the stage condemning their congregations and then going and doing some hidden business in the background. People do not need to hear people like, say, for example, Pastor John Haggy, who openly condemns his congregation from their sin, from his pulpit, fails to preach the gospel, yet hasn't realized that he happens to be excessively obese. Does he not see his love for food? Does he not see his gluttony? People don't get wide like that from eating locusts and honey. So how is he able to condemn his congregation? Once again, I am not particularly judging John Haggy here or any of these pastors. I'm not condemning them. I am using them as a highlight to show you the hypocrisy of what they are teaching. Philippians 3 verses 12 to 13, Paul himself acknowledges that he has not reached perfection. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Paul admits that he has not yet attained complete perfection or sinlessness, even as an apostle. Paul clearly teaches that while believers are saved by grace through faith and we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, they will continue to struggle with sin. They are called to walk in the Spirit and not let sin reign in the body, understanding that the full victory over sin will not be realized until we are glorified. If this message was to be shared among the Christian congregation, we'd have a lot less issues here. The Christian life is one of ongoing transformation, reliance on God's grace, not on instant perfection or even long-term perfection. Sanctification is an ongoing process and no one reaches a point where they are beyond sin while in this earthly life, full stop. Sanctification is something that God does in the believer by the Holy Spirit. It's not something that we can carry out on our own. Leaders who preach holiness as a proof of or evidence of salvation often set themselves up for failure and discourage believers at the same time. When someone makes an effort to try and uphold the law and follow the commandments, whether explicitly or implicitly, They are in serious risk of creating an image of perfection that even they cannot meet. This can lead to secrecy, guilt, and eventually moral collapse when the internal conflict becomes overwhelming. Paul's point is that while sin no longer reigns in the life of a believer, it still remains a reality. The difference for believers is that they are no longer condemned by sin, but they continue to rely on the grace of God daily. Romans 8, one. For there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. These examples from Swaggart and obviously the other leaders reinforce the dangers of misunderstanding good works and sanctification and cu- confusing it with legalistic righteousness. Sanctification is a progressive work of grace, not something achieved through personal effort or perfect understanding of the process. When pastors set an unrealistic expectation of holiness, it will result in moral failure when they themselves can't live up to the standards that they preach. Sanctification is progressive. It is God's work in the believer, and it does not ever make a person sinless in the body. Philippians 1.6 Rest in this, that he who began a good work will bring it to completion.